Good morning, RICC. At this time, the children can be dismissed to the Sunday schools. Today we're coming to the third part of our series through the book of Daniel. And just as we're coming into this, I'd like, I'd like to start off with a question. And that is, if my pointer is going to work here. Ah, uh, there we go. Whoops. There we go. <laughs> we'll start off with a question this morning. And that is, what would you do if idolatry actually became the law of the land where you lived? What would you do if idolatry was basically forced upon you, like you were, t you were commanded that you must worship this person or thing um, in your country? Now, it sounds like a pretty far-fetched idea, but it's actually not as far-fetched as you might think. Um, some of you may have heard the news that's been coming out of China lately where Christians in their churches are now being forced to hang pictures of the president of China and, uh, and you know, the chairman of, well, from the past of China in front of their church on either side of the cross. They're also being forced in many places to take down any exterior symbols from their churches that would indicate that they were Christian. So what would you do? in that situation? Would you stand firm and worship the only true God? Or would you go along with what the new laws in your country say? Daniel chapter 3 actually presents us with a situation where this very thing happened. Now in the book of Daniel, uh, it takes place at a very low point in Jewish history as we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. The divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah had fallen to Assyria and Babylon. And according to the scriptures, according to the Old Testament, this was because of their unfaithfulness to God. Because they were worshiping things other than God, God exiled them from their land. And yet, the book of Daniel teaches us that God still reigns and his kingdom will still prevail. And each chapter has been revealing different applications of that theme. Chapter 1 encouraged us to continue living for God in the midst of a godless and pagan society. Chapter 2 encouraged us to keep relying on God. And chapter 3 presents us with a situation in which idolatry is being forced upon some of the exiles of Israel. And this story is meant to encourage the exiles to remain faithful to the only God who was able to save them. Remain faithful to the only God who was able to save them. So that is the core of our text today. Remain faithful to the only God who can save you. Okay, so what's going on in this story? We're going to start off with Daniel chapter 3, um, verses 1 and then 4 through 6. Starts off in not such a very good way. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, skipping down to verse 4. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Once again, we're re reminded of the, the brutality of King Nebuchadnezzar. So what's going on here? Well, he sets up a golden image. And by the dimensions of this image, it's, it's ten times taller than it is wide. Uh, I think what we're really dealing with here is an obelisk of some sort. Um, an obelisk was basically something that was built by kings in those days to honor their own achievements. They would build this gigantic tower, and on the tower they would have inscribed onto it um, everything that they've done, and all the people who have, have had to come and be subjected to them, and all these sorts of things. And so basically, this was, this was an image of gold in order to 
honor Nebuchadnezzar. And remember, he has it built. So he wants this to honor himself. And now he is bringing everyone else in on this. And he says, you know what? All of you need to worship this image which is honoring me. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. So the actual idol here is Nebuchadnezzar himself. Interesting, isn't it? We actually see that happening in several countries around the world where the leaders of those countries have elevated themselves to that level where they expect people to actually worship them. Okay, and so what he does, who, who has to attend this? He's, um, he set up this image and uh, he's going to have a dedication ceremony for the image. And the dedication ceremony is going to require the attendance of everyone who is in any sort of government position in Babylon. They've all got to come out, and they've all got to fall down and worship this image. Now, incidentally, you might, re you might recall that in the previous chapter, in chapter 2 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and the dream he had was of an image, and the head of the image was made of gold, right? And uh, this was a statue that was shaped like a human being. And the head of it was made of gold, and the other parts of it were made of different materials. And uh, it's, it's kind of an irony, then, that in the very next chapter, he, his great idea is, hey, why don't I build a gigantic golden image to honor myself? Now, I think that the word image here is actually pretty important. So I want to spend just a minute or so on that, because uh, Daniel, as a uh, man with the wisdom of God, I believe he chose his words very, very carefully. Now, keep in mind, this chapter of Daniel is in Aramaic, uh, but, and the word image actually um, in Aramaic corresponds to another word in Hebrew that's very, very similar to it. And uh, it's a word that is used first in the book of Genesis. You might know where I'm going, right? In the beginning, you know, God, when he created the man and the woman, he created them in his own image, right? And so that's, that's the first place we find this word. So people are created in the image of God. And it seems that the only one who's allowed to make images in this way is God himself, right? He creates people in his own image. And, and we're supposed to be glorifying him because we're made in his image. So what a strange travesty it is then when we make images of other things that God also created and we fall down and worship those things. So that's what's going on here. So everyone related to governing Babylon is compelled to come and attend this dedication. And uh, the decree is announced. So. If you've ever lived in a monarchy, you know the way decrees work, right? The king stands up, he speaks, and his words become the law. So now this is the law in Babylon. Everyone must bow down to this image. And the word, the, the phrasing here is really interesting. All peoples, nations, and languages, he says, must worship the image as soon as the musical signal starts, and they must do so on pain of death. Now. We'll get into that a little bit later. So uh, we have this universal compliance going on, right? When the music is played, everybody does what they're told. And so then we have these three Israelites who've been exiled from their country, standing among this crowd. What must they be thinking at this moment when they hear this decree? Well, I think the first things that probably came to their mind was the first and second commandments of God in Exodus chapter 20. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. And here's the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God. Very, 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 very clear. And this, this actually is a theme that goes all throughout the Old Testament. There are so many times that the people are commanded, 
not to make idols, not to bow down to them, not to have any gods before the one true God. And in fact, it is the reason for their exile from their land. So here they are, standing in the midst of this. And they know what the law is. They know what God's word says. And now they're caught between that and the command to go ahead and bow down to this image. And there's intense pressure on them to comply with this. Intense pressure. Because now the law is against them. The law says, now, now that the king has spoken, the law says you must do this. The penalty is extraordinary. Okay, do this or be thrown into the furnace that we used for making this thing. The culture was against them because everybody else did it. So everyone else was complying with this, but these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, boldly refused to worship this image. They stood while everyone else was bowed down. That made them very conspicuous. And whenever we refuse to worship and instead challenge the idols in our world, we are bound to run into trouble. We can expect trouble. And I think the experience of these three Israelites in Daniel chapter 3 gives us a, snap, a snapshot of the kinds of troubles that we can expect when we refuse to worship the idols of our world. So what happens in the story? Well, the next thing that happens is that, uh, well, we'll just read it in verse 7. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So everybody does it. Everybody complies. They all get down and worship. And it, it's so emphatic here if you look at the original languages because it says peoples, nations, and languages. So that's, that's pretty inclusive, right? That's everybody who's there. Not only that, but the phrase peoples, nations, and languages is used seven times in Daniel chapter 3. So the idea is that this is, this is everybody. And everybody's doing it and they're continuing to do it. Except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So one of, the first, one of the first things that will happen when you remain faithful to God is that you will find yourself in the minority. You will always find yourself in the minority. And uh, this is actually a theme in scripture that the people who are faithful to God are almost always going to be found in the minority um, around, you know, amongst the rest of the world. For example, you have the family of Noah and his family who are preserved through the flood when the rest of the world is ignoring God. You have these faithful Israelites during the exile. And then finally, Jesus said that there are two roads that we can walk on. One road that leads to life, one road that leads to destruction. The road that leads to destruction is wide, easy to find, and many people will go that way. The road that leads to life is narrow and difficult, and only a few will find it. So those who remain faithful to God are always going to find themselves in the minority. Um, being in the minority often leaves people vulnerable, and that's exactly what happens in this story. Because we see in the next few verses here that some people came forward to accuse Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. People who doubtless saw them standing when everybody else was worshiping. Interestingly, these people are not the police. These people are their peers. People who are supposed to be wise men alongside them. So, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So 
Do you think they actually needed to remind Nebuchadnezzar of what he said? <laughs> Not really, but they're just trying to be, trying to emphasize here. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the, old, the golden image that you have set up. So, they are brought before the king, they're accused, they've become vulnerable because they dared to stand when everyone else was bowing, and, uh, and they've refused to worship this golden image. So they're brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, and what we read in the text is when this happens, uh, Nebuchadnezzar gets very angry. Um, he, he seems to get very angry many, many times in a lot of the texts of the first few chapters of Daniel. Uh, that seems to be part of his character. So he gets very angry, and he, tell, he gives them another chance. He says, look, when the music plays, if you go ahead and do what I told you to do, then you know, we'll just sort of forget this ever happened. But, he says in verse 15, if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Those are the words of Nebuchadnezzar. And I imagine that God looking down on this situation, maybe is his thought as well, this guy needs to be taken down a notch or two. Now, an interesting thing happens here though, because he speaks to them this way, he threatens them again, and he tells them basically, in no uncertain terms, that there's no God that can save you from me. Right? Nebuchadnezzar is really worshiping himself. And what actually happened here was that this gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego an opportunity to bear witness about God. And that's what they do in the next verse here. They answered the king. And they said, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no re need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand O king but if not be it known to you O king that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up complete utter refusal to go along with the worship of this golden image and yet at the same time an opportunity to bear witness to the one true God so those who remain faithful to God will have opportunities to bear witness to him. Jesus actually promised this to us in uh, Luke chapter 21. He said, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. That is a great promise. That is a great hope. And that's exactly what's happening back in the story. God doesn't change. So he, he gives them this opportunity to stand there in front of Nebuchadnezzar, in front of the other wise men of Babylon, in front of all the government authorities of Babylon and proclaim that there is a God who is able to save us out of your hands, O King. And because of that, we will never bow down to this image that you've placed in front of us. So they, those who remain faithful to God will have opportunities to bear witness. But at the same time, those who remain faithful to God may, far, may, may face harsh legal consequences. And that what ha that's what happens here. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and his face was changed before them. Uh, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This verse is actually kind of a pun if, in the original language. He's filled with fury and, and the word for fury, just like in English, the root word of it in Aramaic actually is fire, right? And then the expression of his face, expression in the original language means image, right? So 
he was filled with fire and the image of his face changed against him. So what do we have in this whole chapter? We have a golden image and we have a fiery furnace. And now we have the golden image and fiery furnace in the same place in Nebuchadnezzar as his face no doubt turns red and you know, you've seen that happen before when someone gets really, really angry. It looks like their face is filled with fire. <laughs> um, that's, that actually, I mean, happens with my skin as well if I get angry. Uh, face turns red and veins pop out and start to look really strange and scary. Well, the image of Nebuchadnezzar's face changed because he was filled with fury against them. And so what's he do? He commands that the furnace that they use to make this golden image be heated as hot as it possibly can. He says it says seven times hotter than normal. And the idea there is as hot as they can make it. And he has them thrown in. Now, we've heard this story so many times that I think this part loses its, its shock value for us. Because here they were, they stood in front of the king and they declared that our God is able to save us from you, but then what happens? He throws them in the fire. And there's a, a pause there in the text where we're, I think we're supposed to stop and, and think about that. Oh my, did God actually save them? Is God going to save them? This is what they are facing. They're facing, in this case, the legal consequence of being faithful to God. The anger of the authorities. And in this case, the death penalty. They've been cast into the fiery furnace. But then something amazing happens. I imagine that when they were tossed into the furnace, the king was expecting to hear their screams as they burned, but the screams didn't come. And so he looks into the furnace, and what's he see? He turns to the people next to him and he says, didn't we throw three people into the furnace? Yes, king, we threw three people in there. And he says, but now I see four people not burning, not in pain, not even bound with the ropes that we bound them up with, walking around there in the fiery furnace, and they're okay. And, and the fourth one there, he says, looks like a son of the gods. So remember, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't really have much idea of, of, what, of who the God of Israel is, right? So he's looking in here and he sees maybe this bright, shiny figure who's standing there with them and he's like, what's going on here? A son of the gods is standing in there. And you know, we might want to jump straight to the New Testament with this, but what's really important, I think, is that God did not abandon his people to the flames of that furnace. Instead, he walked through those flames with them. He was there. And so this is what happens next. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the fiery, burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, he admits it. Come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. So they're all gathering around, they're all looking, and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. As if they had just walked through nothing and come back again. This is the core of the text. God is able to save those who remain faithful to him. God is able to save those who remain faithful to him. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, had no real power over their lives. And in that same way, there is no king or authority who ultimately has power over our lives today. God alone has power over our lives. Now let's not forget that previously they said that even if God does not save us in front of you today, we will not bow down to this idol. So there are many, many times throughout history where the people of God have been killed. 
And we will, well, did God save them? Yes, God still saved them because we're looking forward to the day when he brings us back to life again in the resurrection and we'll be living with perfect bodies that never die, never grow old, and we don't have to worry about this kind of thing anymore. So God does save us. No one has power over our lives as Christians apart from God. Threats from the king did not make them comply. The hottest furnace he could make did not kill them. And in fact, their trust in God was vindicated in front of everybody who was there. Remember, everyone was gathering around to watch this spectacle, and out they came. Everyone saw that the king had no real authority over these people's lives. So in the epilogue of the story, King Nebuchadnezzar blesses God. And uh, as we read just before we started here, he makes some new terrifying penalties for speaking against their God. Um, not that we would wish that kind of penalty to be made against people. And he promoted them in Babylon. So there's the epilogue. Now, at this point in the sermon, we have to look at this and we have to say, well, how do we apply this to our lives today? Because, I mean, we look around and maybe right here in Korea, uh, is the government actually setting up any idols that we're supposed to worship? And, well, and not really. So how do we apply this to ourselves today? Well, there are definitely idols in our cultures and in our societies that we are more and more being required to worship. And as, we, as this is beginning to happen, I think a good question for us to ask is, who am I in this story? Am I part of the crowd who worships the golden images of our society on command? So what are some of the golden images of our society? Well, our society, in general, we worship youth, don't we? And as we grow older, we feel like we're losing something. But one of the biggest things that our society worships, the biggest, one of the biggest golden images that our world has set up is the idol of sex. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. You can't go walking down the street now without being bombarded with sexual images because they use it for advertising, right? They know it attracts our brain, and so they use it for advertising. Um, I read recently that 30% of all the data that is sent across the Internet is pornography. 30%. Do you know how much data is going across the Internet? That's extraordinary. We're fixated on this. And we're so fixated on it that that sexual desire has been elevated to such a point that it now defines our human identity. You remember before, in, in the beginning, what, what is our image? What, what, is, what is human identity based in? It's based in the fact that we're created in the image of God in order to care for and rule the earth. That's who we are. But our world today is telling us that who we are is determined by who we are sexually attracted to. So our identity and our self-expression is tied to this. And also, Human freedom is more and more de being defined by how sexually uninhibited we can be. That is, how, how, how we can go out and have sex with anybody at any time, and freedom means not having consequences for that. Nothing can stand in the way of that freedom now. Not even our own unborn children. And uh, moving on from that, even our morality, whether you are a good person or a bad person in the eyes of our culture today, is determined by whether or not you support these trends. The music 
has started to play, and all eyes are on us to see if we will fall down and worship this golden image. So are we part of the crowd? When we know what the Bible says, we know that, that sex is a beautiful and wonderful thing that God has created to, to be expressed in a specific time and place in our lives. And if we, if we express it the way that God has designed it to be expressed, then it's, it's amazing and it's wonderful and it produces beautiful offspring. And this brings us to the second idol that I'd like to mention this morning. Um, and it goes along with the character of King Nebuchadnezzar in the story. Are we the self-worshipping king who flies into a furious rage the moment our idols are challenged? Because that's what was going on here, right? He built this golden image. Three people said, we're not going to bow down to this. And he was furious. Particularly because he was worshipping himself and other people were refusing to worship him. One of the greatest golden images that's worshipped by human beings all around the world is ourselves. We worship ourselves. We, we say, I can determine what's right and wrong for me. Don't you realize that is exactly what Adam and Eve did, isn't it? When they looked at the fruit that God told them not to eat, and they reached out and they took it, and, they, and, and Eve looks at it and, it says, and she says, well, it looks good. It looks delicious. It, it might make me wise. I'm going to choose for myself now what's good for me and eat this thing that God told me would kill me. And what happens? They died. I determine what's right for me, right and wrong for me. And that goes right along with the previous idol, doesn't it? Instead of letting God determine the proper place and time for sex, we say, I'm going to do what's right for me. I don't care what God says about it. This even happens in the church. We have Christians who will say, I can't believe in a God who, and then, you know, you fill in the blank. And you realize what we're doing when we do that. When we, when, we, when we do that, we're actually standing in judgment over the Word of God. We're standing in judgment over God, and we're saying, you know, if, if God is like that, then I'm not going to believe in Him. So what's going on? We're... we're essentially recreating God in our own image and then worshiping that image. So basically then worshiping ourselves. Whenever we, we look at the Word of God and we elevate the parts that we like and we, and we think are good and then we trim out the parts that we think are bad, we're not worshiping God anymore, we're worshiping ourselves. Are we the self-worshipping king who flies into a rage the moment our idols are challenged? The text teaches us today that we must be the faithful worshippers of God who refuse to serve and bow down to any of these golden images that our world sets up. And it's not easy. The text is clear about that too. We can expect to be accused and brought before authorities. We can expect that, uh, well, as Jesus said, we'll have opportunities to bear witness to the gospel. And I think that's very, very important here because uh, my, my intention in this part of the sermon is not to beat you over the head with the Bible. My intention is to try to expose some of the things that, are, that, that we might be worshiping because I love you guys and I, I want you to be more faithful and more conformed to Christ. Same for me. When I'm, when I'm talking about these idols, I'm, I'm not saying that I don't have any problems with this. I have all sorts of problems with these things. But this gives us an opportunity for the gospel, for the grace of the gospel, because all of us are saved by grace, and we're sanctified by grace, and we're moving towards conforming more and more closely to the character, to the image of God, 
and that gives us opportunities. So expect to, expect to possibly face legal consequences in the future because of this. But at the same time, remember that God is able to save us. God is able to save those who remain faithful to him. So trust in God for your salvation in the midst of all of this idolatry that we find in our world today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that you reveal yourself to us through it, that you have shown us what's good for us and what's right and what's evil. Lord, help us to worship you only. Help us whenever, whenever an idol is brought to our attention that we have been complicit in the worship of, Lord, help us to tear it down. Help us to be faithful only to you. And we thank you, Lord, so much for your salvation that you sent your Son who died in our place, fulfilling all of the law so that we can stand righteously before you. We thank you for your Spirit who comes into us and helps us more and more to conform to your image and not any of the images that we have set up or our world has set up. We thank you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to continue.